Okay, thanks so much. I'm, I'm really glad to be back. So uh, I will talk to you about uh, double copy of Young Mills and double field theory. Uh, by the way, can you hear me? Is the micro microphone working? The microphone is working. Ah, I see. Okay. Okay, well, speak up if you can't hear me. Um, anyway, so here uh, I will talk about two papers. Um, uh, the first together with Jan Plefka and our joint student, Felipe Diaz. And the second one with my postdoc, Roberto Bonazzi, and also Felipe. Um, so let me start with a brief outlook. So here's the plan of the talk. Um, so first I will give you a quick reminder of double copy. So double copy is something developed in the amplitudes community. It's a method to go from gauge theory to gravity amplitudes. And uh, this is not an audience of experts, I, I gather. Um, but also, I won't need much of it. So double copy is a, sort of, a, at this point, a broad uh, motivation, but not too many details are relevant at this point. Um, and then I will come to two particular constructions um, of how to go from Young-Mills theory, so just plain Young-Mills theory, as you all know and love, uh, to uh, a version of gravity that is known as double field theory. Uh, modulo some technical uh, constraints. So most importantly, so far this works to cubic order. Um, so in its field expansion, the quadratic, cubic, quartic, et cetera, it works to uh, cubic order. Um, so it's not complete yet, it's the beginning of a program, because otherwise it would be a major revolution at this point, but so far it's the beginning of a program. Um, and so we have two approaches. The first is extremely simple, uh, I call this Lagrangian double copy, because here we literally just look at the Young-Mills Lagrangian and implement what I think is the simplest possible double, double copy procedure. And I will tell you that this leads to double field theory to this order, modulo uh, some technicalities which are related to the so-called dilaton field that needs to be integrated out in a certain gauge condition. Now the second approach is more sophisticated and more in line of the subject of this uh, conference, namely it involves these higher algebras. So this is an algebraic approach. Um, and that is uh, more general in the sense that it's fully gauge invariant and off shell, and uh, it, it gives you all the couplings to cubic order. So there's no technical, you know, sort of no fine print as given here. Um, and the construction works by starting from the so-called L-infinity algebra of Young-Mills. So I think here I don't have to introduce L infinity algebras, but I will do it anyway. Um, and we'll write this algebra as a tensor product of a so-called kinematic algebra and just the Lie algebra of the gauge group, so the color, color algebra, if you like. Uh, no, everything is infinite dimensional. I will explain uh, how, how it works. Um, and then the statement is the double field theory, uh, the cubic truncation, uh, is encoded in an L infinity algebra on this tensor product. K tensor K bar. And I will explain what all this means. So one main goal of my talk, apart from explaining these technical results, is to convince you that double field theory is indeed the right or definite framework to understand double copy. So for those of you who know me, you will say, well, this, he's the double field theory guy. Of course, he sees double field theory wherever he looks. He probably can't help himself. Um, so my goal, one of my goals here is to convince you that this is not just in my head, that is really something out there in the world, uh, a deep relationship between just the structure of Young-Mills theory and the structure of gravity as encoded in double field theory. And then I'll finish with an outlook. All right, so let me start with a quick review of double copy. As I said, not much is really needed in detail, um, but let's start there anyway. So here's the four-point amplitude of Young-Mills theory, so you can look it up. That's the only amplitude that will show up here. This is just a um, sort of broad motivation. So uh, the four-point amplitude is a function of uh, four momenta, P1 to P4, and four polarization vectors, which are just the uh, Fourier modes of the, of the gauge field. Um, and it's written here. So you have the momentum conservation between the four momenta. This is enforced by this delta function. And then you have these three terms the C, CS, CT, and CU, so-called color factors, meaning they're built with the structure constant of the Lie algebra, which is a term like this. Um, 
the S, T, and U are just the standard Mandelstam variables. So S, for instance, is P1 plus P2 squared, etc. And then you have these objects N, S, and T, and U, which depend on polarization vectors, so the Fourier modes or Fourier, yeah, Fourier modes of the gauge fields. Um, for instance, these Sn, Ns is, is a function that looks like this. So the dot product is just the usual dot product um, of vectors. Um, and you have an expression like this. So that's the four-point amplitude of young mills theory. Now the double copy tells you that uh, provided that there's a certain uh, uh, presentation of these three terms, and S and T and U, um, you can just replace the color factors by kinematic factors, or a second copy of the kinematic factors. So you, uh, you substitute for the Cs here, a uh, second copy of the kinematic factors, the n bars, to write an amplitude that looks like this. Now there's no color factor anymore, and the statement is that this is a gravity amplitude. So this goes back to Byrne, Carrasco, and Johansson, and in fact it has a much older history in string theory going back to the 80s uh, in terms of the so-called KLT relations that relate uh, sc uh, scattering amplitudes of closed string theory to open string theory. Yes, yes, so everything I'm doing is tree level uh, at this point. So, yeah, so what, what, so the more precise statement is that this is the, gives the scat tree level scattering amplitudes of, of gravity, but not just pure gravity, plus a B field, so a two form is the gauge symmetry and standard kinetic term, and the scalar field, the dilaton, and that's exactly the spectrum of of closed string theory, where at the massless level you have not only the metric but also the B field and dilaton. And that sort of very naively is in, in this construction, this guy has a has a has an anti-symmetric part and a trace part. So it's not just what I will do will correspond to that, yes. Um, in in this particular formulation of double field theory. But this year so far there's no action. This is just uh, amplitudes. So this relationship is sometimes summarized under the slogan gravity equals young mill squared, which is very catchy, but of course nonsense. Uh, but let's see if we can give some meaning to this. So that's the, just a quick review um, of what people do in amplitudes. And now what I want to do is implement uh, a, a reasonably simple procedure at the level of a Lagrangian or of the off-shell field theory not at the level of amplitudes, to see if there's a similar relationship. Okay, so that's the first part, the Lagrangian double copy. Let me start with some, just some general remarks. Um, so first of all, uh, people in the scattering uh, uh, amplitude community would be somewhat skept skeptical whether this is a reasonable approach, uh, because scattering amplitudes, of course, are on-shell and gauge-fixed objects. To compute them, uh, you have to gauge fix. So to ask, can I see this at the level of Lagrangian, where I have all these gauge redundancies and off-shell stuff floating around, seems to be a bit besides the point. So it's not guaranteed a priori that this is a reasonable approach. So we have to see whether it works. Now here's a quote from Herman Nicolai, some conference proceedings that I like very much, where he writes, no amount of fiddling with the Einstein-Hilbert action will reduce it to a square of a young Mills action which of course is true, it's an entirely accurate statement, and it's true for at least two reasons. So the first is, now that the square of the Young-Mills action, of course, just gives you nonsense. It doesn't give you anything that looks like uh, a gravity. So you, if you want to have any chance of succeeding, you have to uh, be a little more sophisticated of what you mean here. But the more important reason that this is an entirely correct statement is that you're not gonna find the Einstein-Hilbert action because it's really important that you have the B field and the dilaton in the game. So the double copy of Young-Mills immediately leads to something that is not just Einstein, pure Einstein gravity, but it's actually the low energy, well, it's lowest order low energy action of closed string theory. So we have the B field and the dilaton. And in fact, it also comes out in a formulation that is not the way we usually write it, but really the double field theory version I will introduce here. Okay, so what I will 
tried to show in the first part of this talk that indeed there's a slightly more sophisticated way of fiddling with the action so that uh, it works in the following way. So first of all, uh, we are supposed to replace the color indices um, that the young Mills gauge field has uh, by something else. Because remember in the construction of the amplitudes, the color factors just uh, go away. Um, so we'll replace them by a second set of space-time indices. So a color index like A goes to a second set of space-time indices where I put a bar to distinguish them from the first set. Okay, so I have the usual space-time indices mu. Now the A index goes to a mu bar. And correspondingly, I will introduce a second set of space-time momenta, which I call K bar, which also makes sense because uh, we had the original kinematic data involving the momenta or in, in the the Fourier transform way, the space-time coordinates. And now if I'm supposed to replace the color structures by a second set of kinematic structure, it's natural to introduce this field. So I have a field which I call E mu mu bar, depending on two sets of momenta. And these two sets of momenta are, of course, exactly what links to double field theory, which is a formulation of the space-time actions of string theory with two space-time coordinates that are linked by a constraint that I will introduce in a moment. So this works, as I said, to cubic order so far. And now let me introduce, let me explain how this works. Okay, so let's start by looking at the Young-Mills action. Here's the familiar Young-Mills action in D dimensions. So F mu nu is just a standard non-abelian field strength. A, B are color indices, and kappa A, B is some Cartan invariant Cartan killing metric, or whatever gauge field you have. So that's the familiar action. Now we have to start at the free level. So we expand this to quadratic order and let's go to momentum space. So Fourier transform to get something that looks like this. So here I've written the kinematic operator momentum space and I've scaled out the K squared. Um, so what is left, pi mu nu is written here. So this is just eta mu nu minus K mu K mu over K squared. And this one over K squared is because I've scaled out the K squared. So this, uh, I'm sure you've seen many times, this operator is actually a projector, so pi squared is equal to pi. And uh, it has the property that it has a null eigenvector, so pi mu nu contracted with the k nu itself is just identically zero, as you can immediately see from this expression. If you contract with the k nu, the k squared here goes away, and you have k mu minus k mu is zero. So the fact that this has a null eigenvector, of course, is just the expression of gauge invariance. If you shift the gauge field by something with a k mu in front, do it here, it will just be annihilated and you get zero. So that's just the standard expression of linearized gauge invariance. Yes. So lambda a is here the gauge parameter and that's just the familiar gauge invariance, okay. So that's just the free theory. Nothing has happened, except that I chose to write it with, by scaling out this k-squared. So now I told you that I want to replace uh, a mu a by e mu mu bar. Um, so in order to do that, I have to uh, declare what I do with the kappa a b that here contracts the, the color indices, which now will be substituted by a second set of space-time indices. And what I, what is, well, I think arguably the most natural thing you can do is to just replace it by a second copy of this projector pi, uh, which I call pi bar. So this is now has indices mu bar nu bar and depends on the second set of momenta k bar. So that if I do this substitution, I end up with this action. Very good question. Uh, so here, the doubling uh, sort of looks uh, asymmetric because here I, I, I kept the k squared untouched. I introduced a second uh, copy of pi. Uh, so why don't you write uh, k, k bar squared or the sum of the two, uh, which you could do. Um, the, the, that, that's now information coming in or motivation coming in from string theory because there we in fact put the constraint, which is the level matching constraint, that k squared is equal to k bar squared. So the two momenta, which are completely independent to begin with, now declared to be subject to a constraint, which is this 
yeah, that's indeed uh, a subtle question. I would like to postpone it uh, for later. Uh, you can, of course, just to, to feel safe, be super pragmatic and say k equals k bar, and you just use this as a notational device uh, to, to make the double copy work easier. And that's, of course, what we always do in practice, specifically if you want to explain double copy giving you standard gravity. Uh, there you get a standard gravity theory with one set of coordinates and one set of momenta. Okay, um, And so at each step you can just decide that this is just notation and k is just k bar. And then there's no confusion like this. Um, so maybe for now let's just, let's just assume. Yeah, that's weaker than just saying they're the same. Um, and I'm saying it in this form because we know in string theory there is this weaker version uh, of this constraint uh, leading to a genuine double field. Yes. Uh, so eventually I want to get there. That's why I'm phrasing it here in this uh, weaker form. Uh, just for pragmatic reasons, probably safer at this point if we just say k equals k bar. Um, and then this is just sort of a notational trick to distinguish these two sets of indices. Okay, because in fact, the full action always has this index separation that you don't see in uh, standard gravity. If you take standard gravity, expand it out, there's no trace of it. But double copy tells you it it's ought to be there, and it's very hard to, dis to disentangle if you start from, from the standard formulation of gravity. Okay, so I've now written this action. Uh, the k squared is outside, and as we'll see in a second, that makes a lot of sense because now you have done a doubling, but it will give you a normal looking uh, gravity action. So in particular, it will be something that has two derivatives in it and not like something with four derivatives. So if you would naively square Young Mills. Um, um, it's also, in fact, what the. Yeah, if you if you just if you're super naive, you say Young Mills f minus f minus f squared. I guess something. So of course that is silly, but uh, just to say it. Um, just as a reminder, how the double copy worked here. Uh, here we replaced the color factors by kinematic factors, but the propagators uh, one over s, one over t, etc., were left untouched. So that also sort of tells you that it's not just squaring; it's something more subtle. And that is the analog here is just keeping the k squared outside and doubling only the pi pi factor. Okay, so now let's analyze this, uh, this action. So first of all, you immediately have this gauge invariance here, which is the first thing you can think of is the usual abelian gauge invariance that comes from the original gauge field, uh, k, so something proportional to k mu. But now you've introduced a second redundancy because the second uh, indices, the new ones, are now contracted with an object uh, with the degeneracy two, so now you can shift it with a k bar, mu bar, and a new parameter, lambda mu. So you have now two independent gauge parameters that are both vectorial in this form. Uh, in fact, these, sorry? Yes, pi bar is exactly the same formula, just every, you put everywhere bar, that's it. Um, and you see also here why I like to keep this k-bar notation because I want to distinguish these two indices. Okay, so now I have this gauge invariance, which is the right one because I want to discover the diffeomorphism gauge parameter, but also I want to discover the uh, B-field gauge parameter, which is a one-form parameter. So using a metric, I have sort of two vector parameters. Okay, so now here's the claim. So this is double field theory to quadratic order. And what I mean by this is more precisely that if you just look at that action, of course, you have non-local looking terms because this projector has a one over k squared in it. So if I multiply two of them, I get a bunch of one over k squares. But it turns out that I can make it local by introducing an quote unquote auxiliary scalar phi, uh, which is uh, the, the dilaton field, uh, and write the following action. So here, if you integrate out phi, you get from these two terms, you get a one over k squared times this contraction. And if you re-plug it back in, you recover the original action. So in that sense, this is exactly the original action with the two pi's. Um, and note that from this formulation, the phi is not actually a scalar. So this is not the usual scalar dilaton of gravity, but it's a redefined version of it where the trace part of the metric is absorbed 
into it. So that's the version that comes up in double field theory. And that implies that it has this gauge invariance here. So it's not a scalar. Um, now, if you take this action, you go back to position space or double position space. This is, in fact, just the free part of the double field theory actions with, with two double derivatives subject to the what's sometimes called the weak constraint, um, which is would just be identity if you um, if you identify these two sets of coordinates. And so if you set them equal, this is just linearized gravity plus B field plus Dillerton. So it's the standard action uh, Einstein Hilbert with the plus uh, the Dillerton plus the B field with the e to the minus two phi in front, et cetera, et cetera, linearized to quadratic order. So I think this is the simplest relationship I've ever seen between just the linearized, uh, the quadratic part of the young Mills action and the free part of a gravity theory. Okay, but anyhow, it's a free theory, so justifiably you're not impressed yet. So let's see if we can do the cubic one. Um, okay, let's look at the cubic part of the young Mills action. Here it is. Uh, this is proportional to the young Mills coupling constant. You have the structure constant FABC, and you have this cubic term. Now, if you go to momentum space, uh, you can rewrite the action in this form. So there's, again, the structure constant. Uh, there's a delta function comes in, and there's an operator now with three indices, pi, mu, nu, rho, because we have three fields. So the notation here is the one, two, three, uh, refers to the uh, momentum label. That is the argument here. Um, and the pi uh, is this object here, uh, which is linear in the momenta, and it's just this combination where the k12 is k1 minus k2, et cetera. Okay, so how can we double copy this? So again, we replace the a's by the e's, so the color indices should go away and be replaced by a second set of space-time indices. So I need to replace the FABC by something that has three space-time indices, meaning the barred space-time indices, the second copy of it. And well, what can I do? I think it's completely obvious. Uh, I just replace the FABC by a second copy of the pi mu nu rho. So everything gets the bar now, but the formula otherwise is exactly the same. Uh, it's just this one. So I think everyone should agree that it's just what you would do. So if you do this, uh, you get the following action. Um, you get two pi's, pi and pi bar. You have three e's. Now you can go again, pull your transform and go back to position space. And you get up to some integrations by part. You get these one, two, three, four, five simple terms. Um, so uh, this looks um, quite simple compared to some cubic actions of gravity that you can look up in the literature. Uh, but the claim is that this is, in fact, uh, the cubic part of double field theory in a particular gauge. So this is, now we give up gauge invariance, that the quadratic order actually gauge invariance nicely works, but at cubic order, in this prescription, uh, you, you have to go to a particular gauge. Yeah? Yeah, so you take uh, E mu mu bar to be the metric fluctuation in a particular under particular redefinitions. So there's some field redefinitions involved. And you also have to use the, the dilaton, it's not just the, the, the scalar dilaton of standard gravity, but it absorbs the trace part of the metric in a particular combination. So there's some highly, well not highly, but sort of non-trivial non field redefinitions going on to connect the two. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it doesn't end. Yes. Well, uh, the, the, the short answer is I don't know, because I keep emphasizing that what we're doing here is the cubic order. Um, yeah, so, so one thing, uh, an obvious idea, which in fact is also suggested by what the amplitude people do, is that you just have to work of, with the formulation of gravity and perhaps even Young-Mills that is cubic to begin with, because we know that exists. 
you can write a cubic version of the Young Mills action. And uh, this is slightly less known, but you can also write a cubic action for gravity. I don't know quite yet how to write, so you have to find the right formulation for it. It's not just enough that it's cubic, but it's perfectly conceivable that you find a cubic formulation and then everything should be much simpler. Looking at what? Well, uh, so that's one possibility how, how that eventually maybe may work out. Another possibility is that, and this will really be relevant for the second part of the talk, there is this uh, construction at the level of the corresponding L infinity algebras. And it may just be that although you have an L infinity algebra in Young Mills that has only a finite number of, of brackets, at most the three brackets, that the construction on the gravity side will induce an infinite number of brackets. That's perfectly conceivable as well. I gave you two good answers, so you should be very happy. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm glad that, I should have said that first, I guess. Okay. Um, right, so the claim is that this is cubic gravity in the form of double field theory in a particular gauge, which is called the Siegel gauge. So this is something that comes from string field theory. Yeah, yeah, we just use the gauge condition in the action. So everything we're talking about is tree level uh, stuff. So, uh, well, so what I will do in the second half of the talk doesn't use any gauge yet. So that's really the pro probably the proper way to do things eventually. This is sort of a simple warm up to see how simple things can be. Um, now the Siegel gauge is something that arises in what's called string field theory. So I won't use anything of string field theory really just to say String field theory is a formulation of the uh, uh, of string theory as a uh, as really as a standard field theory, but in, but with an infinite number of fields. So um, in closed string theory, the string field uh, has various components, even to to lowest level. So it doesn't have just the e mu mu bar, but it has certain uh, pure gauge auxiliary fields and also some propagating stuff. Um, so you have two, two more vectors and two more scalars, and the free Lagrangian that you get out of string field theory uh, looks like this. So here you see that the Fs don't have kinetic terms, so in fact you can just integrate them out, they're just auxiliary fields. Um, and and the pr in the process uh, you get back the previous action of free double field theory where the Dilaton phi is this combination of E and E bar. So you have these two scalars, but actually only one combination is physical. The other one turns out to be pure gauge. There's also an extra gauge symmetry that kills one of the two. So that is totally equivalent to the previous uh, action. That, I just take it from the literature. I won't go to the derivation, but it's, there's this construction of closed string field theory uh, where you can write the, certainly the quadratic term is totally explicit. So you, take the first quantized uh, string theory starting point, the corresponding CFT, you set up a world sheet action. There's a whole construction, I won't go into it, but uh, this is, you can find the string field theory literature and that's just what you get. So this for me is just a historical side remark to justify the language uh, because this gauge condition I keep talking about, the Siegel gauge is particularly simple in this formulation because it just tells you that F and L bar, F bar is zero. So here you use these two gauge parameters that we saw, lambda mu, lambda bar mu, to set these two vectors to zero. And uh, in fact, on shell, this is equivalent to standard the Donder gauge in gravity. So if you use the on shell values of f and f bar as obtained from this action, setting this to zero is a standard the Donder gauge. Um, so if you use uh, this condition in the cubic double field theory action, which I'm not giving you because it's fairly well, it's not so complicated still compared to standard cubic gravity actions you find in the literature, but it's somewhat messy. Uh, if you use this gauge condition, then you get back the double copied action I had on the previous slide. So this is the simple relationship between the double copying Young Mills um, and uh, the cubic version of DFT in this particular gauge. Okay, any questions? Okay, so then uh, we come to the second part. 
uh, the alt called algebraic double copy. So this, this was nice because it was so simple, because it's really you do the most obvious thing and you just find double field theory to this order. But of course, we're not yet totally satisfied. First of all, because uh, it worked in a certain gauge and really one of the motivations was to, to have a gauge invariant formulation. And also we had to do this business of integrating out the dilaton uh, that wasn't so nice. In principle, I would like to have a procedure that gives me also all the dilaton couplings in the action. And third, I would like to have a procedure that has at least the potential uh, of going to all orders. So I need something slightly more sophisticated, and this is uh, what I introduce now. Okay, so I start with one slide of the relationship between L infinity algebras and field theory. So this is a workshop dedicated to higher algebras. So I'm sure most of, this, most of you know all of this, but let me just gi give a one slide summary. So if I write down a, a space-time action uh, perturbatively, so I have, by which I mean there's a definite notion of terms in the action in quadratic, cubic, quartic, etc. cetera, um, then I can think of this as defining an L infinity algebra with certain structures. Uh, there's a map B1 that has one input, a map B2 that has two inputs, a map B3 that has three inputs, etc. There's also an inner product that makes this into a scalar. So the structure of an L infinity algebra is a graded, an integer graded vector space, uh, X, um, where, so I is an uh, integer degree, so it can run from minus infinity to plus infinity. Um, and there will be this, in addition, these graded symmetric maps, B1, B2, B3. Graded symmetric means that if I exchange any two uh, arguments, I get a sign depending on whether the object is odd or even. And these uh, maps that define the L infinity algebra are subject to generalized Jacobi identities. So the first one is just that the B1, which is a map from the vector space to itself, is nilpotent, so it squares to zero. The second one is in the compatibility condition between this differential and the two brackets, so two product, which is a, a Leibniz rule. So if you act with B1 on B2 on something, you can move it aside inside according to the Leibniz rules. The signs here are slightly funny from the viewpoint of the sort of how we normally would write it, but this is a convene, this is a change of convention here, a uh, step known as suspension. Um, so this is totally equivalent to a standard way of writing it. But this is more convenient here. And then most importantly, you have a, a Jacobi identity. So this is like the standard Jacobi identity of, of a Lie algebra, or of a graded Lie algebra, where certain signs come in, where you take this nested bracket B2, B2, with three arguments, and add up three terms. Now, this does not need to be zero, uh, but it has to be satisfied up to homotopy, and this means here that uh, the failure is controlled by the three bracket and the differential in this form here. So this, these terms you can also think of as, as the uh, failure of B3 to satisfy the Leibniz rule with respect to B1. Yes. Uh, well, what I'm saying is that um, it would not be gauge invariant. So it would be, you can sort of, because, well, I should have written any consistent field theory. Um, in general, it's a gauge. We can also cover a non gauge invariant. So, like the scalar field theory is covered as well, um, where all these identities are obeyed by degree reasons. So, if you want to write a theory where these relations do not hold, I think you would have to do something where you start, in principle, you could do this. You start with a quadratic term that has the gauge invariant, uh, some gauge invariant, and then you add a cubic term that is not compatible with the gauge invariant. Then th these relations would fail at some point. And those theories we would not consider in physics ever because that's for one of the basic consistency requirements. So, I mean, this is not a math kind of statement because what is a consistent field theory? I don't, I don't know. What I'm saying is any theory you would normally consider fits into this framework. Yeah. 
the, these inner products, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Right. So, right. So that's the notion of a, of a cyclic L infinity algebra. Um, that's exactly right. So it's like a, a, a sort of a compatibility condition between the two. Uh, so the basic L infinity algebra is something that you can define if you, have equ if you think only in terms of equations of motion, not an action. If you want an action, you have to have a cyclic L infinity algebra. Okay. So that's just the definition. Um, and maybe I should say that these spaces here, depending on the degree, have different interpretations. So there's the space of fields uh, in this convention in degree uh, zero. Then there's the space of gauge parameters, space of field equations, Noether identities, uh, Noether for, uh, so gauge for gauge if you have it, et cetera. So that's um, so the different meanings of the spaces, and if you specialize these identities to these different spaces, you can convince yourself that these consistency conditions are just the usual, any kind of consistency condition you can think of, like gauge invariance of the action, so the gauge invariance of the action, closure of the gauge algebra, uh, Bianchi identities, whatever you like, is encoded in one of these um, uh, generalized Jakob. The, the A here is, no, the, the ghosts and ghosts for ghosts are, are in sort of lift, is, lift is re, are still there, but they live in different spaces here. So it's a bit of a reshuffling. That's the classical action. Um, I'm not considering the BV action here, but th th there's a relation and th the objects are still there, um, but in, sort of interpreted differently. Okay, so let's now just make it a little more concrete. Let's look at Young Mill's theory. And I will use young mill theory in particular formulation uh, that in fact also comes from string field theory, this time open string field theory. And I write the free part of the action like this by introducing auxiliary scalar var phi here so that if I integrate out phi, I get back the standard kinetic term of Maxwell or young mills. Um, and the point of this formulation, apart from coming out of open string field theory, and so it seems like the right object, is that it allows us to, to single out the box term in a gauge invariant fashion. So remember the previous construction, we treated the k squared in a special way, so we scaled out the k squared, and that's exactly motivated by the double copy construction of amplitudes. So you're not supposed to double the k squared. Um, here, um, we could of course just gauge fix and just write a mu box a mu, but I don't want to gauge fix, so we need a way to treat the box uh, in a special way, and you can just do it in this form by introducing auxiliary scalar. So this is still gauge invariant, with phi transforming according to its on-shell value. So actually phi is just shifted by box lambda, if lambda is the gauge parameter. Okay. Um, so all fields here are Lie algebra valued, so you can expand it in this way. EA are the generators. Um, and now the L infinity algebra lives on this vector space. So x0 is the space of fields, so the numbers here are the degrees according to the integer grading that you always have. Uh, so I have this calligraphic A here, which is the total field space, so here it consists of A mu and var phi. I have the calligraphic E, which is the corresponding field equations. Lambda is, is the gauge parameter, and this space here, which I call the object I call N, is the um, uh, sort of neuter identities. Um, so the differential, the B1, uh, is just read off from the linearized gauge transformations between, uh, or the linearized uh, field equations, or in fact the Bianchi identities, and they are read off like this. So this just tells you that A mu transforms into D mu lambda and phi into box lambda, and the field equations for A mu are box A mu minus D mu phi, and for phi are D, D dot A, meaning the divergence minus phi. So on shell, phi is equal to the divergence of A, and then you recover the standard equation. So that's just the differential that encodes the free theory. Um, but then, of course, here we have also the cubic term and the quartic term, and they are encoded in higher brackets. In fact, you can read them off straightforwardly, but just demanding that the nonlinear Young-Mills equation looks like this. So that's the general form uh, of the so-called generalized mara katan equations given an L infinity structure. And by just looking at the Young-Mills equation, you can match it and 
find that these, the two bracket, which encodes the quadratic term, looks like this, and this three bracket, which encodes the cubic term, just looks like this. Now that's, in this L infinity algebra, that's the only uh, three bracket you will have, so it's very close to an, uh, what's called a differential graded Lie algebra, so where you have the graded Jacobi identity exactly, but not quite, because there's this cubic term, sorry, the quartic term in the action, and so there's a three bracket. Um, just to complete the dictionary, uh, not to complete, but to extend it a little further, here are the nonlinear gauge transformation, so now the B2 comes in, now between two different objects, a lambda and an A, a parameter and a field, and then it looks like this. So here you also see that the B2, depending on the inputs, may be completely different objects. But the claim is that all these together form an L infinity algebra. And this is something I said before in words, that so that what we normally would consider the classical consistency of this theory, gauge invariance, Bianchi identities, or closure, all these things you normally check, or we, we checked long ago for young Mills, uh, is, is uh, implied or equivalent to the generalized Jacobi identities of L infinity. So in that sense, I can just think of L infinity algebra as the uh, language in which I encode a field theory. Okay. So now I need to do a little more uh, to get started with the double copy, uh, which is I have to find a way to strip off color. Um, and so this, in fact, can be done nicely here um, because this L infinity algebra I can write as a tensor product um, of, of another algebra, which I call K, and the Lie algebra, G. So the color Lie algebra that we always have in Young-Mills, I can factor out. And what is left by itself has a nice algebraic interpretation. Uh, and this works as follows. So to begin with, I have this Lie algebra valued objects. So like any object X can, uh, can be expanded into X A T A, where T A are the generators. So then I can try to factor out the color uh, objects, the color indices, as follows. So I write the B1 of any object X like this, uh, of two objects like this, or three objects like this. And then what is left defines maps, brackets, M1, M2, M3, uh, which are now defined on objects that are not Lie algebra valued anymore. Right, the XA here now is just a, it's, it's just a label uh, because the generators have been taken out. And the claim is that if you do this, you end up with a different structure. So you have now new maps, M1, M2, M3, that form what is called a C-infinity algebra. So what's a C-infinity algebra? An L-infinity algebra was X and A. So the, here, these are all Lie algebra valued, uh, because that's the original Young-Mills thing. Here I've expanded. What is x, uh, this, this small x here? Uh, that's any object in the, in the original space. So all the, like a gauge parameter, field, whatever, they're all Lie algebra valued. So, so each of them can be expanded uh, with generators like this. And I'm, all I'm saying is uh, I want to think of this object without the gauge factor, so I, I, without the generator. So I, I factor them out, and what is left uh, defines something, defines a map that lives on objects that are not Lie algebra valued. I mean, these are still have these indices, but they are just labels now. So I can, eventually I can drop them. Um, and what I want to say is that these define a C infinity algebra. So what's a C infinity algebra? An L infinity algebra is, so is what mathematicians call a homotopy version of a Lie algebra, or a differential graded Lie algebra, meaning that you have a Lie bracket that satisfies a graded Jacobi identity, you have a differential that squares to zero and is compatible with it. And in the same way, there can be A infinity algebras where you have an associative product, and the associativity in this case may fail again up to homotopy. And the C infinity algebra is a commutative, so C stands for commutative version of this. So it's a homotopy version of a graded commutative associative algebra. Now, commutative means that the M2 is actually graded symmetric. Uh, it has a, so it has a symmetry property, and that symmetry property uh, is compatible with this formula here because the F is anti-symmetric. So this has a definite symmetry, so this needs to have a definite symmetry for this equation to make sense. So that's where the C comes from. Now the 
M2s that are defined in this fashion satisfy this associative, associativity like relation here. So if, if you didn't have these terms um, and you think of M2 as a product, uh, this would just be the statement of associativity. Now this does not need to be zero, it can fail, but the failure is governed by this N3, which is related to the B3 of Young Mills and hence indirectly to the quartic term of Young Mills, yes. It's K is universal. So, I mean, any Young Mills theory is, uh, is like the, the game is this, right? You give me a Lie algebra, I give you back the Young Mills action, right? So, there's a universal way of extracting the Lie algebra as just a blob. Yes, yes, yes. I will, I will say a little about it. Uh, here we go. So, this K is. Uh, as a vector space looks, in fact, exactly the same as for Young Mills, except, of course, that the objects, the elements, are not Lie algebra valued anymore. So, where I had before, let's say I had a Lie algebra valued vector field in degree zero, there's also a degree shifting here, but never mind that. Uh, where before I had a vector field in degree zero that lives in the Lie algebra, now it's just a vector field, and similarly for the other component. So, at the level of the vector space, that's all that happens. I've taken out the Lie algebra index. Then apart from this uh, shift in degrees, um, uh, well, the M1 looks basically the same because there's no nonlinear structure. This is the M2 and um, let me see if I have some formulas. Um, no, unfortunately not. Um, but you, you can sort of imagine how it works, right? You, you, you imagine the, 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 the three vertex of young mills where there's an F in it and you just take it out, that defines the two product. And then it's a non-trivial statement that that two product has nice relations, but that's the claim and you can check that it satisfies the axioms of a C infinity algebra. Okay, so this uh, works uh, universally in fact for any formulation of Young-Mills, I think. Um, but here we use this particular one, we have these extra auxiliary fields. Uh, so the structure of this vector space here has a further structure uh, it has a Z2 grading because I can group the objects like this. I have one line here, one line here. Um, I can also, if I want to, I can also write this in a basis where I have uh, different components, plus, mu, minus, depending. Yes, yes, you can, should think of this as the space of equations of motion. In, in right, right, so it has two, it has m one more component, exactly. Um, so you can now define, uh, uh, you have now an extra structure which is the so-called BC ghost system. So the, you can define operators B and C, in this particular basis they're just given here, um, that both square to zero and C has degree minus one, B has degree plus one. But on this, in this diagram it's just like uh, you can go, there's an isomorphism, you can go back and forth here, they're both scalars. You can back and go back and forth here, they're both vectors and similarly here. And uh, one is called B, the other one is called C, and they satisfy some nice relations. So B squared, C squared is zero. Uh, the anti-commutator of B and C is one. And most importantly, you have this compatibility equation between M1, the differential, and the B. So M1 in this convention has degree minus one, B has degree plus one, you have this relation that the anti-commutator just gives you a box. So here you see again the box playing a special role, as again is um, suggested by the amplitude business. So now, so this is just the formulation of Young-Mills. I had this particular formulation of Young-Mills. I take out color, that gives me a C infinity algebra on a vector space K, which is essentially the original vector space that just takes out the tensor product with the Lie algebra of the color gauge group. So now I want to do double copy the last five minutes. So I want to define again an L infinity algebra. Now it's an L infinity algebra that defines, again, a field theory. Uh, it should define the, the, the double field theory. And the claim is that this is uh, a subspace of the tensor product K tensor K bar. So K bar is just the second copy of this algebra of vector space I constructed before, the kinematic, K for kinematic algebra. So I take a second copy and I can build the tensor product K to this K bar. Uh, 
Um, so first of all, um, maybe coming back to your question from earlier, this space naturally carries the structure of a C infinity algebra. If K is a C infinity algebra, K bar is a C infinity algebra, and K tensor pin bar is also C infinity algebra. And while the original C infinity algebra has at most a three product, this one, in fact, has infinitely many. It never stops. So there you see the first indication that something that is finite on one side made by tensoring gives you something with infinitely many products. Now, the problem is that I don't want the C infinity algebra. I want an L infinity algebra because I want to find a field theory. And that's where we have to go to a smaller space. And then it's complicated. And that's why we only so far really only understand how to do it to cubic order. Okay, but the way this works is as follows. So we have this extra structure with the D and C and D bar and C bar for the second copy. So I build, I can build this operators D plus minus on this space. Um, and I have two boxes, as box and box bar on these two spaces. And now the claim is that the uh, double field theory subspace uh, is defined by these conditions. So the D minus defined here on psi should give zero and delta psi should give zero. So these are known as the level matching constraint in string, in string theory. They're exactly the level matching constraint in string theory, so they're not just invented, they make sense. And then if I impose these two conditions, then on this subspace, I can define uh, the bracket and the two bracket, sorry, the differential and the two bracket by these formulas. So the differential is obvious, it's just M1 the first copy and M M1 bar on the second copy. There's not much else you can do. Uh, the B2 is a little more subtle because you're taking M2 tensor M2 bar, um, but then you have to also act with the B minus and project onto the subspace. So this is, makes it very non-trivial. Now, if you go, if you want to check Jacobi, let's say, but the Jacobi actually, so the P is the, um, is, the, is the projection on the subspace delta of a delta psi is equal to zero. Delta is this operator here. Uh, you, you can again be pragmatic if you want and say that the, the coordinate depends, so the x coordinates corresponding to k and the x bar corresponding to k bar are just identified. Say they're the same, in which case box is equal box bar, and then this is just a triviality. It doesn't need to be imposed. The more important thing is really this b minus because this is needed for degree reasons and uh, um, also for the Leibniz relation between the two to work out. And it's also uh, uh, appears in string field theory. So this is, has to be there and as far as I can tell. Um, so the statement is that these define the cubic truncation of an L infinity algebra and to cubic order, all this means is that this guy squares to zero, which is trivial given that M1 and M1 bar square to zero. And this B1 and B2 satisfy the Leibniz identity. And this uh, in particular requires a relation between the Bs and the M1, and this is this one here. So this works out. But this is all I need for the cubic theory, because now I can, in cubic order, I can write the action. Um, now this, again, there must be, a, there is a similar rule for the inner product, but it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Let me not dwell too much on it. So given the B1 and the B2, I can now the quadratic and cubic terms in the action and just work out what I have, just using the original uh, maps from the L infinity structure, and I get this action. So here are the quadratic terms, and now it's reproduced exactly in the form of closed string field theory I gave earlier. So the Fs could be integrated out to give the standard action. And now the cubic terms are these cubic terms between E's, and then in this formulation, there's just one more term added, which is this one here. So in a sense, before we were already super close to the full cubic action, it's just this one last line miss, was missing, but this is all you need to complete this to a gauge invariant uh, formulation. So this is in fact much simpler than the original formulation of double field theory given by Hull and Zwiebach, um, but of course it's field redefinition equivalent, so we can explicitly establish the field of definitions between this form and the other form. So this is presumably the simplest version of cubic gravity uh, you can write. Okay, so I'm basically done. Um, I have one more comment on the, uh, the gauge transformation. So here's a 
Um, so since this is a map between algebras, this does not just capture the action, but also the gauge transformations or Bianchi identities. So now you can ask, what, is, what about the nonlinear gauge transformations of gravity? Uh, at the beginning of my talk, I had the linearized gauge transformations, which came out nicely. But since we are now at cubic order in a gauge invariant form, I should see the, the nonlinear gauge transformations. And indeed, this prescription tells me what they are. And they're literally just read off from the cubic vertex. So this is something quite, I was quite astonished by when, when we first saw that. So if you look at the cubic part of Young Mills, okay? So let's go back here. Uh, so the B2 encodes the cubic part of Young Mills. So I don't do anything. I look at the cubic part of Young Mills. I don't think, I just read it off. And I write it in this form. So the, the structure constants uh, I, I write explicitly, and then that defines uh, an operation which I call bullet here, which is essentially what I called M2 before, except the M2 has more components in the full algebra where you take the other spaces into account. But if you just read off the, this bullet from the three vertex of Young Mills, you get this formula. So it's something that's first order in derivatives, and it's this formula. Now, the claim is this is exactly what defines the nonlinear first order gauge transformation of the gravity field in BFT in the sense that the lambda parameter, the gauge transformation is this lambda bullet E, where it take this BART index as inert. So this is just something that we find on the space of unbart indices. And then I get an output, a, a, a new index. So this is true up to terms involving the auxiliary fields, the, like the Fs and, and other auxiliary fields you have then in double field theory. There's a similar term, this is the BART version of this. So in that sense, the different morphisms of gravity, or at least part of it, are directly encoded in the three vertex of Young Mills. I'll just read it off. Okay, let me summarize. So the first part I gave you what I think is the simplest double copy implementation at the level of the Lagrangian. Uh, intriguingly, it gave you a gauge invariant double field theory to quadratic order, modulo integrating out to scalars. And to cubic order, it gave you the Siegel gauge fixed double field theory. Now in the second part, uh, I gave you an off shell uh, local, and so this was sort of non-local because you had the one over k squared floating around. Uh, but then the second part, I gave you a local formulation, uh, fully gauge invariant um, to cubic order. And there we start with Young Mills uh, as a homotopy Lie algebra or L infinity algebra on k tensor g. And that defines a kinematic algebra, K, which itself is a C infinity algebra. And so it, at an algebraic level, we do sort of what the amplitude people you're supposed to do. You take Young Mills, you take out color, and then you s put it in a second factor of kinematics. So this is like K tensor K bar. And on the level match subspace, this defines the L infinity algebra of BFT. Now, can we make this work to all orders? Um, it's, it's a bit of an issue what exactly you mean by making it work. Of course, you can construct the full L infinity algebra of double field theory. We know already it exists because we know the full theory. But you want something that really purely works, builds it from the young mill structures. Uh, and to make this more precise, it's, it's, it's not totally obvious, at least not to me. But what is certainly encouraging is that the diffeomorphism structure, the nonlinear diffeomorphism transformations that are the gauge transformation of gravity are already there. You, s you read them off from the cubic vertex of Young Mills. That's just what it is. So this is, I find, pretty amazing. And if you think of the construction of normal gravity uh, as some kind of Noether procedure, starting from the free theory, uh, as Feynman did it in his famous lecture notes, once you have the cubic theory and, and understood, therefore, uh, the linear, the diffeomorphism, the nonlinear diffeomorphism action, you really, you know everything. So basically, it's supposed to work now to all orders. Uh, it's just, just in quotes, an issue how to make this precise. Uh, another natural question is, what about classical solutions? So there's a, a growing literature on using double copy at the level of classical solutions, like black holes. Um, and since this is an off-shell construction, uh, this should work as well. And then finally, what about non-trivial backgrounds? So this is very background independent so far. Everything works around flat space. And so you get double field to expand it around flat space, but eventually one would like to see other backgrounds. So I want to advertise my recent paper with Alison Pinto, who's sitting there, 
uh, where we consider double field theory and cosmology, meaning consider time-dependent backgrounds, and just introducing one more sort of coordinate on which the background can depend, namely just time, uh, introduce a huge amount of complications, everything becomes much more subtle. And of course, it's known that cosmological perturbation theory is hard, but it's extra hard in this framework. So one would be very nice if one could also understand non-trivial backgrounds uh, in, in such a framework. All right, let me stop here. Thank you very much.